This is the beauty when you don't work with... Uh, can we dim the light, please? Now? Yeah. This is the beauty when you don't work with Max MSP and Windows and stuff like that. It boots up in 10 seconds and it actually works. Ha <laughs> ha! Um, okay, what, what are we going to talk about? Um, liquid space is actually an idea that's been haunting me for the last three or four years. Ah, now it's booted up. It's the idea of making spaces which actually becomes bigger and smaller according to your senses. And um, when maybe it's good to give like a little intro of where this kind of sci-fi techno poetry comes from. Um, uh, when I was 16, I was dragged by my fine art uh, tutor to the NIE, which I didn't know was called the NIE at that time. Um, and I was, sh I, I was studying for a sculpture then, and I was shown like these big wooden dark models uh, of Arato Isozaki, a, a famous Japanese architect, the, the, the Rem of Japan, so to speak. But I didn't know all these things right now, but at that time. But the moment I saw these models, I, I realized, well, wow, this is what I want to do. Like, like lar spatial things which have a relation with people. And somehow I started to go into the sculpture, into the architectural sense, which was Michel referring to. But at the same time, I became fascinated of how technology is becoming more and more a part of our, in the way who, who we are. Eh? I mean, all these people that, that have been talking tonight are, are addressing that. In a time a la Facebook, a la Hives, a la Google, a la LinkedIn, the tech is becoming more integrated in our body and in our environment. And I always had a need to, to actually make things which, which would relate to you in a more dynamic way. So, so I moved away from making static art objects and I wanted to make things which had like an engagement with you in a social, spiritual, semi-functional or artistic or physical way. So the fun part was is that when we were, ah here, that's not moving towards you. When um, we were building this artwork, uh, this was just a thing that I started on my own. The idea like when you enter a space, it starts picking you up. And this is of course like a very simple mood, so to speak. But the thing, and you will experience by yourself, I'm not going to do it for you, the more types of input it has, the more different types of interaction it will occur. And it's actually, you know, it, on one hand it has a mind of its own, so after, if you do a lot of time uh, things the same, it will start to ignore you. But on the other hand, it's always trying to, to move towards you, like this extension of your skin. Um, uh, but there's always this situation of co-control, so the thing has a mind of its own, but, but you also want something, and, and it's like, a, like a, an open dialogue, so to speak. Um, oh yeah, but to end, that's what I wanted to talk to you, the end the story of the, the, the tutor. So the fun part was is that we got a call from a museum in Yamakuchi, in the west coast of Japan, a couple of months ago, uh, YCOM, which is like one of the nicest institutes for me uh, at this moment, uh, like the V2, but then in Japan. And they uh, existed 55 years, and they wanted to have like a new artwork a Dutch guy like me. So I took a plane, I got out of a cab, I, took a, I w took a walk to the museum, and I saw the building and I was like, no way. It was a building of one of, it was one of the models that I saw in the museum when I was 16, but then in the flesh, it was the same architect. So I went inside, I checked, yes, it was him. And actually, uh, three months ago, we had an opening and he came, the Arato Isozaki, and we were standing right here in the spotlight, talking to each other. He's like this 70 year old guy, completely brilliant in his mind still, talking about the effect of technology, how you can make an engagement, a social engagement with your audience in architecture via technology. Anyway, this kind of, I'm completely interested in this kind of, um, yeah, let's just call it like this, this progressive reality. And um, what I mean by that is, a hundred years ago an escalator was something completely static, huh? like you know, it would be take you up and down and that was it. But now when I walk into the bus in the metro station, actually the escalator starts running when I slowly enter it. I find this completely natural. Even, you know, if it wouldn't have worked, I would be completely annoyed that it didn't work because I had that perception. And I mean, but if that would have happened a hundred years ago, for sure I would have gotten a heart attack. So what I think about what is interesting to, as an artist to work with these kind of new technologies is that you explore these kind of shifts of what we find natural or not and these kind of shifts of what people gives a heart attack or not. Um, 
And so I'm interested in this new natural aspect. And um, I think, and then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll leave the audience a little bit to experience. What I'm interested in is, is, is maybe not so much in designing things, which we do a lot eh, in the studio in terms of the way it looks like in the detail, the type of interaction it has, the, fig, the thing that you move away from the beamer and the display that you can actually touch it. Please don't do this. Um, it becomes physical. It becomes you know, something you can feel in your stomach. Um, and I think, I think it's m more and more it's moving towards, uh, towards that, uh, that field. Okay, now you can ask uh, difficult questions to me. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions straight up? Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to know, you mentioned the extension of the skin. As yeah. A important inspiration for this artwork. Could you elaborate more on that? Sorry, yeah, of course. Um, 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 uh, what I mean by that is, in the, that's why I'm giving the, the example of the escalator. So it's, it, the technology is used to actually enhance already activities which are there and it creates new type of behavior or new types of experiences. And of course, on one hand, this system is completely artificial. Huh? There are infrared sensors, there are microchips, the thing is somehow aware that I'm there, it's, it's coming towards me. Um, but at the same time, it's a machine which can learn from its input, eh, but can never think outside itself. What it can do is actually um, give you a sense that it's like an extension of your skin in a way that it, it, it gives you the feeling that, you, that, that it, it is aware of your presence. And what it also does is when you would stand later uh, with more people in it, it actually makes a relationship between people, so it starts to mediate, um, which I really like, you know. So I mean, in that way, uh, that's what I mean. So I don't mean it as a metaphor, which would be horrible. What I mean is that, that what I always, I would love to make things which have this natural aspect, like the escalator, you know. And maybe in, in the fun part is in Japan, um, you were talking about the, 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 the yeah, I know. The, the Japanese, the children which are more natural toward, well, if you go to Asia and Japan, yeah, the, the, they are completely, they don't have this sentiment about technology, uh, so it becomes more natural in that way. Did, did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, thanks for participating. And, and what I mean, technology is just a great tool in order to create this kind of um, awarenesses. Yeah, for me. Do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about what goes into your thinking about the form factors, the, the, the sounds, the, the colors? You want to talk about the thing itself? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we can do that. Well, can I mean, you tell us about the jellyfish. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. Tell us about no, the jellyfish. No. I know you're spoiling everything. Um, 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 uh, you, you, I mean, you, yeah, you, you, some. It's always very tough to find, uh, this is quite recent stuff, so it's always hard to, to describe where it comes from, but one day you, woke, you wake up in the morning and you don't want a cigarette or, uh, or, or a breakfast, but you have an idea. And this time it was an idea to, about the liquid spaces, which I already described. But I also became somehow fascinated uh, by these uh, jellyfishes, uh, uh, which I saw a lot of in, in aquaria in, uh, in Asia. And they are like also completely insane uh, about, about them. Like they, some actually have them as pets, huh? not like a hamster, but as in home. And what I like about the jellyfishes is, is on one hand they have this natural aspect which I was referring to, and they're completely 100% nature. But on the other hand, they're, they look so artificial and they use light in order to communicate with each other. Huh? The red light for long distances and the short light, the blue light for short. Um, so, and we, I, I remember that we were looking at them in the studio with the whiskits and looking at the movies from YouTube and looking at the lights, and we were questioning ourselves, is this, is this LED, you know? It's like, oh no, of course, it's an animal. <laughs> but the, so this, the, the relation between the artificialness and the natural completely overlaps in this kind of animal. Um, so this was one of the inspiration. And secondly is that I'm completely, we spend a lot of time in developing our own tech, but on the other hand, I'm completely not interested in. So all the sensors and the electronics, it's like embedded in it, you don't really see it. It's more the, the experience it generates than, than actually uh, to look at it or to ask about it. And I mean, it has many, many, many references. What I, what I loved about um, uh, V2 opening on Saturday, yeah, which was completely crowded, was not so much maybe how it looks like, but more what, what it generates. 
And me as an artist, that's always most the fun part to see. And what we had, what we never ex anticipated, and we can do this together, um, is that you know it has like it's when it becomes small, it's quite intimate. So actually, people not, not now, but were kissing each other like this digital mistletoe thing, uh, which was in a way was completely kitsch. Yeah? <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, it, it showed this relational thing, which I like a lot. Yeah. Peace. What 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 the what the fun part is is that so it has a memory. So it, it, they 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 made me put it off. Peace. Huh? So uh, this experience it just had it, it never had it before. So it's getting a little bit excited. But if you do it several times, it will get used to it, so to speak. And it will start ignoring that and waiting for new types of interaction. But, but yeah, get to that later. Connecting to that, um, I, I mean, museum night for for us standing there in the corner was uh, an observational experiment. Like we were all, we were just observing, yeah. right? And what was funny is th uh, that uh, many people came in thinking, "Where is the guy controlling this?" Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> Some people came in, <laughs> and figured it out. It's like, okay, it works like this. Yeah. So how and, like and how some people thought it would rea it re it reacted to women better than guys, which I liked actually. It was like what you said in your uh, preface. Huh? Yeah. But how do you make that balance between uh, an uh, yeah. interaction yeah. design yeah. that is kind of uh, explorable or understandable? Yeah. No. But this this is the this is the thing I I wake up and I worry up at night. Yes. Um. Um. On one hand, you want to give something like a feedback. I enter, and it, it, it you know, it lets me know I'm there. Hello, puff. But on the other hand, you don't want it to be like a mirror. You know, why would you? So you want you want to manipulate the visitor. You want them to suddenly start kissing me with in front of 3,000 people. So you want to generate new types of behavior, and that's I think the thing of the co-control. So, uh, and that's that's actually the hardest part to tune these kind of elements. On one hand, the visitor should contribute. But on the other hand, they want to be used or abused. You know, it's like your typical boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, more or less. Huh? Um, but this this play of co-control—that's uh, that's actually the thing which which creates a performance, which is interesting for me as an artist, but hopefully also for the visitor. Yeah. Do you have a precise? You're, you're talking about the liquid architecture, but I'm imagining uh, urban spaces that changes. And transforms itself depending on yeah. all sorts of things. Could you maybe tell a little bit about how your imagination is of that fantasy world? Well, this is not imagination. We're actually mm. working on that. So yes, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. tell us <laughs> what it looks like. Oh, I mean, yeah. uh, um, uh, well, in a way, this is like a very large artwork. And I know that it's a prototype for architecture. Yeah, so um, uh, how it will look like, yeah, how will Facebook Square looks like, you know? These kind of things, and th these are very interesting. And the fun part is actually that we're getting more and more um, uh, requests from the public and the architectural field in order to, to uh, apply this to an urban setting. But what I let's focus on the Rotterdam part is that this city is incredibly fascinated about creating some kind of cohesion uh, between yeah. different social uh, groups, etc. But what, you, what the fun part is about this kind of interactive architecture, interactive art, or actually all the interfaces which are shown here more or less, is that they create some kind of relationship between you and me, even if you don't know each other. And this kind of mediating sense, which I was referring to, uh, if you start designing squares and architecture in that way, yeah, then you really get like a new urban, urban playground field. And then the city is your playground in order to, to enhance that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Anybody else has questions? Hi. Um, you were using the example of the escalator as this thing that we consider normal, but uh, I'm curious as how you go about designing for this aspect of normal, since the escalators we only consider normal because we saw them so often in movement. Yeah. We consider them normal, but they weren't really designed for that aspect of normalcy. So how do you go about it in your work? Ah, okay. Yeah, well, no, they were designed. They were designed to have more um, square meters to your uh, within your range, and so to speak, within your five-minute walk. I mean, it's true. I mean, it, these kind of projects start artistically. Eh? They are not made to be functional. They have this semi-functionality, but uh, they are they start highly artistically, and that's why they're shown at V2 and in Musea abroad, and. Um, 
but the moment you start applying these things within an architectural setting, different functions or uh, experiences are you know, being popped up. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can answer this question. Uh, I, I think like the moment, yeah, maybe this is an answer. The moment you think, you start putting things in reality, and you should imagine, a reality is always more brutal, more poetic, more dynamic than you can ever imagine as, as, as one little brain as an artist. Things start to make sense in their own little way. You know, people give meaning to the things they have around them, and you, you were addressing that as well. Um, but only, you know, time will tell what, what this new natural will be. And that's the experiment, that's the exploration actually, which I'm a part of. That's actually why we're showing these pieces, to, to figure that out. Yeah. Okay. One more question? Yeah. Um, I'm curious, you have been talking about um, models, about the liquid architecture. This relationship about the, you have been talking also before how these models in a way impress you. I'm, I'm curious about when I see these, um, you're talking about architecture, do you, you see this relationship between models in terms of the scale and, uh, and bigger scale? I mean, would you think that this piece could be understood that something bigger could be yeah. understood in a different scale? Could be, I, I don't know, when I see this, uh, I can imagine that this could be a model part of a much bigger structure or even this could be taken to a much bigger scale. Uh, I'm curious about how you understand if this is for you working as a kind of prototype or... Uh, well, I mean, it's a, it's a principle that we're investigating. So what's the social effect when like you have a 10 foot uh, ceiling coming towards you, one. Two is a technical one yeah, in terms of technology and the interaction. But three, I mean, we're not gonna copy paste it. That would be stupid. We're gonna copy more of it and let the environment and the, and the client and the, and the visitor somehow influence the way it will look like. So don't, I, I, I don't think you should, t please don't take it too literal in that way. It's a principle that we're investigating. Um, and on one hand, I think it's, it's like an artwork which should kick ass, you know, right now as you as a visitor. But on the other hand, it also has a, has a blink towards a, a larger scale. Yeah? Okay, okay, I think it's time to move on. I thank you then.